Okay, um, I guess there's no no magic moment at which one should begin these uh, sessions. So let me open. Uh, I'm Philip Alston. Um, I teach at New York University Law School, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be um, chairing this uh, webinar discussion of the new book by uh, Judge Theodore Meron uh, entitled Standing Up for Justice. Um, I'm going to ask uh, each of our three commentators to uh, pick out some aspects of the book that they think are noteworthy and talk about those. I don't want to try to uh, prescribe the uh, directions in which we'll go. Uh, this is a fascinating book. It uh, really addresses a great range of questions. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet been able to uh, get your eyes on it, since few of us get our hands on things these days yet, um, the book starts with um, a personal memoir written by uh, Ted, if I can call the judge in by his familiar name, um, going back to his very early days, going back to uh, the traumas he experienced uh, during the Holocaust, then to his um, voyage to Israel, uh, the work that he did there, um, both um, his academic work, which then continued, of course, in the UK and the US, and then as legal advisor, and then finally ambassador uh, in Canada for Israel, uh, followed by his academic career, primarily, but not only at here at NYU. Uh, I should add in parenthesis that um, Ted um, started by being um, extremely friendly to me by uh, being one of the key people to bring me to NYU, but then demonstrated great hostility by uh, evacuating the office that he had right next door to me. Uh, and I've seen him a couple of times a year for the last 20 years, um, but I try not to take that personally because he was engaged in other even more important work. Um, Ted, um, then, as he says in his book, at the tender age of 71, uh, began a new career, uh, which consisted of almost 20 years uh, at the top of uh, the tree in international criminal justice. And the book covers all of those exciting developments goes into considerable detail about some aspects of the ICTY, uh, talks, uh, I think gives particular emphasis to the importance of integrity uh, in judging uh, and fairness, uh, and then concludes with a rather detailed set of prescriptions basically for uh, how international criminal justice can be turned into a more uh, comprehensive and um, omnipresent uh, reality, uh, despite the fact that it has got off to something of a rocky start. And in a lot of that final, what is it, 60, 70 pages or so, he is looking at the ICC and the various uh, other uh, mechanisms that um, all complement that effort to uh, set up a, an effective international criminal justice regime. Uh, so it's a very important book. Um, I, I didn't um, do the research that I should have to see where Ted stands in the all-time rankings of American international judges. Uh, but I don't imagine that there could have been 
too many. Uh, I'm not American, so Gene, you should know this, but whether there could possibly be any American international lawyer who has served on an international judicial tribunal for longer than the Honorable Theodore Meron. Uh, I suspect not, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm just trying to suggest for you, Ted, a, a, a world record that you might be able to add to your uh, already very distinguished curriculum, Vitae. Um, in any event, uh, Ted has really made a singular contribution uh, in this area in particular, and that's what we're here to discuss today. So uh, I'm just going to ask uh, in order uh, Dapo, Jean and Diane to reflect a little bit on the, uh, the book and what they take away from it, and then we'll ask Ted to respond. Um, he is a participant in the panel and not just a, uh, a bemused observer, uh, and we want to get uh, some reactions uh, from him. Um, the panel is extremely well known, and I won't go into uh, detailed introductions. Uh, Dapo, who will lead off now, um, teaches at Oxford, has a variety of very prestigious positions, which I won't read out. Um, my um, engagement with DAPO, I suspect, like many others, was mainly through blogs, where I came to really resent DAPO, because he was one of those people who, within 15 minutes of some major complicated development taking place, uh, could come up with extremely insightful and wise <laughs> assessment of it, uh, which I couldn't do if I was given two days to, uh, to perform the same task. Um, he really is an absolutely spectacular blogger, which is something that in this day and age, I think is a, uh, a skill of immense importance. Um, but of course, in addition to that, he's a, uh, a leading academic uh, in a, a range of different fields, including international law in general, uh, but with also particular expertise in IHL and the issues that we're looking at today. So Dapo, over to you to, uh, to react to standing up for justice. Thank you very much, Philip. And it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor, and I'm not even sure which is the higher one, probably a pleasure to be taking part in, in this book launch for, for Judge Theodore Moran, um, who is now and has been for the last few years a colleague of mine at the University of Oxford, where he's been a visiting professor and where he um, introduced a course on international criminal law for us in Oxford, which we had never actually taught as a, as a standalone course. He came and he developed it for us in, in Oxford. And it's you know, just been a pleasure to, to know him and have worked with him over, over the last few, few years. Um, needless to say, you know, the book is, is such an interesting read um, because it gives one an insight into not just the thinking of the man, but some insight into the man himself. And it's nice to see the weaving together actually of a range of um, of a range of ideas that have dominated his work over the course of his career and to to see how he brings all of those things together he, he says a few times he talks about the fact that it's um in the book i mean he talks about the fact that it's sort of good fortune that he's kind of done different things but also actually one sees themes in, in the career. So I have picked out actually individual words that occurred to me as I was reading the book, not, not necessarily words that George Moran uses, but words that come to me. And I'm going to talk about, I think four of such uh, words, and then I'm gonna focus on one area in particular. So the very first word um, is, inspiration, though I did wonder, should I say inspiration or should I say encouragement? But more or less the same, the same thing. And I got that actually in page one. So this is about Judge Moran, but I'll say a little bit about myself. So 
page one, he talks about the fact that he peaked late and he says he became an academic at age 48. So I'm going to be 48 in just about a month's time. <laughs> and it occurred to me that if everything else that comes after page one is work that he did after he was 48, and in many cases, well after he's 48, there is a lot of inspiration there, that there's much more to be, to be achieved. But actually, the inspiration is not so much the fact, you know, that he achieved these things um, that he writes about at, at such an age, but actually it's the fact that he was able to achieve a number of, of hugely consequential things. And it's the weaving together of a number of, of issues, which I think is really interesting to me from, from the book. So the next word that I want to pick out is, and here I'll spend a little bit of time, and that's consistency. And despite the fact that he um, says that actually life has taken him in very different directions, there are some key themes that have come out. So we see these key themes in his writing, and we see the way he weaves them together. So the focus that he achieved actually in these, uh, in these pages on issues to do with, well, just to take the title of one of his books, not this one, the humanization of international law. So that focus on international humanitarian law, human rights, and, and sort of weaving those things together but most importantly, actually, the, the point that I really wanted to pick out in terms of consistency is how he has able to take particular projects as an academic, take those same projects as an innovator in a sense, and then apply those same issues as a judge. And the main thing that I want to pick out there is the work that he has done on the development of customary international law in those areas that he has focused on. So the development of customary international law in relation to international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and, and human rights. And he focuses on this in, in a number of aspects of, of the book. So first of all, you have the work that he did as an academic in writing on these topics and writing on, on the importance of custom. Then you have the work that he did with the International Committee of the Red Cross on advancing and trying to sort of systematize and articulate customary international law, particularly in the context of international humanitarian law. And then you get to his work as a judge. And here he talks about this in, um, if I remember correctly, he focuses on it in chapter three of the book, the beginning of part two, actually, so no, chapter four, the beginning of part two, the role of custom as a judge. And so why is this important? So first of all, it's important because it links with his idea of the rule of law in, in international criminal law. And the idea that it is absolutely essential that international criminal tribunals adhere to the principle of legality. And where are we going to get this um, adherence to the principle of legality if not in custom? Because treaties are very often going to be lacking we need to be sure that these are rules which were actually binding on the individuals at the time in question. And so it's then really important for us to look at customary international law. And of course, the ICTY did a huge amount of work under his leadership in trying to elucidate the rules of customary international law, both in relation to international criminal law, but also in relation to, to IHO. Why is this also important, the role of custom? It's also important because, um, because of the universality of custom, essentially, because there are many areas of these branches of law where even though we have, in a sense, the most widely ratified treaties, but there are many areas that these treaties do not cover, the Geneva Conventions I'm speaking about, and also the additional protocols, and most importantly, because these treaties do not cover um, these principles in the context of, of non-international armed conflict. So the work that he does there. But of course, one issue that is then raised by this focus on custom is how does it develop in this area? How do we find customary law in this area? 
Um, and the, the thing that strikes me and which I think it'd be nice to sort of reflect on is when we think about the traditional methods of developing custom international, we say it's state practice, it's opinion yours, we're sort of based on, on the practice of, of states. When we come to international criminal law, and I use that as distinct now from, from international humanitarian law, the challenge, of course, is that it's not states that are, in one sense, in the main applying international criminal law. Um, it's largely, I mean, they do, of course, through their own courts and tribunals, but today we largely look at the practice of international criminal tribunals. So the, there's a question that's left hanging for me as to whether or not the methods or the modes for developing custom remain the same in this area as we would have it in, in other areas. Just two last words, and I won't uh, elaborate on these. So the other two words that I wanted to pick out are both I words, integrity, the integrity that we see and the integrity that he also, we see in his work and the integrity that he also elaborates on for the international judge. The idea, and he, he stresses this a number of times that the remit of the judge is to apply the law, not to engage in progressive development. But at the same time, and this is the last word, innovation, um, which you see in his career, finding the gaps and seeking to close them. And of course, that's a, a, a tricky balancing act, the integrity in applying the law, but also seeking to close gaps in the law, which he has sought to do, at least in his academic career, uh, um, in no, no small measure. So congratulations, uh, Judge Moran, on a wonderful book. Maybe I'll stop there. Great, thanks very much, Stapo. That's, uh, that's a, an excellent way to, uh, to get us started. Um, Jean Galbraith uh, is next. Jean teaches uh, at Penn Law School, has done so since 2014. Um, before that, she has the most extraordinary um, resume for a law professor, but uh, she was also sentenced to serve uh, two years as a clerk to the Honorable Theodore Meron uh, in the ICTY, and I think has a, um, a particularly uh, interesting perspective, having seen all of this uh, up very close. So, Jean, over to you. Well, th thank you, Philip, and it's an honor to be here with you and Dapo and Diane, and especially Judge Marone. Uh, so to turn what, to what Philip has inaccurately described as my sentence, um, the first time that I met Judge Marone was in 2006. Uh, I was working in DC that year and he had hired me a few weeks before sight unseen from The Hague to be his law clerk for the following year. Uh, and then when he was in DC a few weeks later for the ACEL annual meeting, he invited me to come to the Hudson Meadow lunch where he was the honoree. And I arrived knowing no one. I put my bag down at a random table and I went over very shyly to introduce myself. Uh, and he asked me to come sit next to him during this lunch. Uh, me, his newest future employee at this lunch of full of distinguished scholars and judges who were there to honor him. Uh, so it was a pleasure uh, the entire year. And I think this story illustrates that Judge Marum's commitment to humanity and dignity isn't just an abstraction. It's a part of who he is. And so if this book has big themes in it, it also has a lot of minutia, a real emphasis on getting every case and every individual situation right. Uh, and I think to echo something Philip said at the beginning, this makes it rather hard to characterize Standing Up for Justice as a book. It's got aspects of a memoir, it's got aspects of a treatise, it's got aspects of being a careful compilation of primary sources. There's aspects of a normative narrative. Um, so Judge Marone mentions early in the book that he has a lifelong love of forests, uh, born of his experience in Poland in his early years before the Holocaust. And so I guess I would say by analogy, reading this book, I thought of it basically as like a sort of rich and wonderful tour of an ecosystem by an expert who spent decades studying and protecting the ecosystem. And the ecosystem, of course, being international criminal justice. 
Uh, and so like Dapo, I felt that uh, just as with uh, Hadash Mohan described his own life, there was in the book something resembling an integral whole that emerged from the discrete segments. Uh, so let me focus on one particular theme that comes out of it. And this is the challenge that an international court and its leadership has in achieving effectiveness with one of Dapo's I words, integrity, and another word that I'll put out there, uh, indep independence. Uh, so reading the book, I thought very quickly back to uh, Dag Hammarskjöld's famous speech about the international civil service, uh, where he said in language that I'll quote, although it's regrettably gendered, uh, that quote, if the international civil servant knows himself to be free from such personal influence in his actions and guided solely by the common aims and rules laid down for and by the organization he serves, and by recognized legal principles, then he has done his duty. And then he can face the criticism, which even so will be unavoidable. As I said at the final last, this is a question of integrity." End quote. So that immediately came to mind because I read Judge Marone's book as really making the same point powerfully for international criminal judges whose obligations to integrity and independence stem not from one, but from two roots, um, both from their role as international civil servants, and second, and the one that Judge Marone really stresses in the book, from their role as judges. Uh, and the book makes clear just how much pressure our international judges can face from nation states and from civil society. And one striking part of the book is how candid Judge Marone is in saying how, as a quote, frequent target of fierce criticism, I felt vulnerable, alone, and hurt uh, at times. And these actors, of course, not only have the power to criticize, but also the practical power to support or obstruct their tribunal's work through their cooperation or non-cooperation with investigations and arrests. Uh, and it's not always clear that the United Nations has the tribunal's back as much as it should. So for me, one of the most interesting and disheartening sections of the book was the section on the saga of the Turkish Judge Ake. Uh, judge Ake, a judge on the mechanism, was arrested by Turkey on allegations that he had, was connected to anti-government activity. And with really considerable prodding from Judge Marone, the UN Legal Council asserted diplomatic immunity for Judge Ake, which Turkey then ignored. And an order from Judge Marone was similarly ignored by Turkey. And the UN then declined to reappoint Judge Ake for a new term on the mechanism, effectively acquiescing in Tur Turkey's behavior. And Judge Marone describes how he issued a press release stating that if states are permitted to take action against a judge in violation of the applicable international legal framework, then judicial independence and the integrity of our courts as such are fundamentally at risk, as is the overall project of international criminal justice. In other words, this is not just an ecosystem, but a fragile ecosystem. And Judge Marone recognizes at points throughout the book including at the end that we are at a, at, quote, at a time where the multilateral rule system is increasingly called into question, end quote. And this is not a book that solves that problem, uh, but it argues powerfully that individual courage and integrity on the part of our international judges is a necessary part of the antidote. Um, indeed, as I think back to that, uh, part of what Judge Marone was saying to me by inviting me to come sit with him on that first lunch is that individuals uh, throughout the system are what make the enterprise of international criminal justice work to the extent that it can. Uh, so congratulations, Judge. Uh, I look forward to hearing all Diane's remarks. Good, thank you very much, uh, Jean. It's uh, great to hear that other perspective. Um, and finally, uh, Diane Orentlicker, who um, teaches at American University, who has written and been a very active participant in a, a lot of these issues, but uh, in particular, uh, Diane's book, Some Kind of Justice, The ICTY's Impact in Bosnia and Serbia, uh, is really a, a work of the utmost importance and uh, no one could be better placed to reflect, I think, on uh, Ted's work on the ICTY uh, in that regard than Diane. So over to you, Diane. 
Thank you. Um, I'm also delighted and honored to participate in this event, launching um, Judge Maroon's new book, Standing Up for Justice. As others have already said, but it bears repeating, the book offers a really deeply important perspective about the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal on which Ted served and which owes a surpassing debt to him. And I'll come back to that point, not surprisingly. Shaped and inspired by uh, Nuremberg, tribunals like the one that Ted served on for 20 years um, have inspired both soaring expectations and vigorous debate about what we should expect them to achieve. About 85 years after Nuremberg introduced this model of global justice, we still don't have a generally accepted answer to the question that Hannah Arendt posed about the war crimes trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. What good does it do? Or put differently, what's the point of war crimes trials? The astonishing diversity of views on this point, along with the extravagance, I guess, of many stakeholders' expectations, were brought home to me very um, memorably when I researched my own book on the ICTY, um, which uh, uh, Philip mentioned. Um, one of the questions my book explored was, why this tribunal, which I think of as Ted's tribunal, um, inspired passionate support among many citizens of the former Yugoslavia and not just victims. Another question was the degree to which, in their view, the tribunal lived up to their hopes. One of the people I interviewed, a Serbian civil society leader, perfectly captured the far-reaching expectations that she and others projected onto the tribunal. In her words, we attributed all these amazing powers to the court, like it will establish the whole truth about the conflict. It will punish everyone. It will contribute to reconciliation. It will be reconciliation. And I think these expectations, both their soaring nature and their diversity, um, they cover a lot of ground, are kind of the other side of the pressure that Jean mentioned that um, uh, is often exerted on a tribunal like the ICTY and most especially its leadership um, because it goes without saying that these expectations uh, as, as the people I interviewed um, came to realize just can't be uh, fully realized in the way people hope their expectations will be realized. Um, Judge Moran is acutely aware of these expectations as he discusses in his book. And he wants to be very clear about how he answers the question, what is the point of war crimes trials. And Dapa has already touched on um, some of the themes that I uh, thought were really important. As I understand uh, what Ted was saying, um, the answer to the question, what is the point of all this, um, is inseparable from the centuries-long global project of humanizing the laws of war. And that's a project to which no one has made a more substantial contribution than Ted himself. Uh, and his belief um, is that war crimes tribunals can make this law matter, provided they scrupulously observe core precepts of fairness. As Ted writes, his childhood experience of a war that surpassed any other in its cruelty instilled in him, quote, a desire to use the law to bring an end to atrocities. And here's a crucial point. Much as nature abhors a vacuum, Ted abhors a gap, or I think what he would call a lacuna, in the protection of human rights afforded by international law. So, and again, I'm, I'm really building on what Dapo already said. Ted's made it his life's work to close those gaps. In standing up for justice, he makes a compelling case that modern war crimes tribunals have been hugely consequential. In no small part because they've played a vital role in clarifying the specific ways in which international law's protection of humanity has advanced while also illuminating the broader transformation of the law of humanity that underpins specific doctrinal developments. To paraphrase um, some of what uh, Ted wrote in his book, these courts have enhanced the norms of the hard law set forth in the Geneva Conventions, strengthened human rights law, and opened new avenues for enforcement. Now, those kinds of concepts can seem highly abstract. And 
For that reason, they can seem remote to the concerns of those who've endured unspeakable crimes. So I wanna share that the ICTY's judgments clarifying substantive international law provided some of the most satisfying experiences of justice among victims of wartime atrocities in Bosnia in particular. And I'll just give one example. In a landmark judgment that was written by Ted, the appeals chamber of the ICTY found that the 1995 massacre in Srebrenica met the extraordinarily stringent definition of genocide under international law. Many, many, many people I interviewed in Bosnia and as well and in Serbia as well describe this judgment as one of the most important achievements of the ICTY. As one Bosnian noted, the ruling meant that family members of the thousands who were slaughtered in Srebrenica in a matter of days, quote, were recognized, named, they got a sense of life, they were able to start life again. Uh, one survivor told me that the tribunal's determination of genocide in the Kerstich case, quote, is what is, what is the most important to us, to the families, to the victims. For them, <laughs> this judgment alone meant, and again, I quote, that justice is reached. This was a judgment, a pass, a, a, their assessment of the entire record of the ICTY. That judgment alone meant that justice is reached. Um, anyone with even a glancing acquaintance with international humanitarian law knows that before Ted joined the ICTY as a judge, he laid the intellectual foundation for some of its most significant rulings. There are many examples, um, as has already been alluded to, and I'll, I'll mention just one. Uh, in July of 1995, Ted published an article making the case that common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 not only established core principles governing international, I'm sorry, internal armed conflicts, but also the violations of those principles could give rise to individual, that is, criminal responsibility. Five months after that article appeared, the ICTY's appeals chamber reached the same conclusion, hardly a coincidence. And um, anyone familiar with the ICTY's case law will tell you this was a signal achievement, um, this, this ruling. Um, I, I was gonna talk about the, the broader um, illumination of the process of customary international law that Ted's scholarship and this book illuminates. I'm gonna pass on that because Dapo elucidated this point um, so beautifully. <coughs> but I will say, um, as, as others have alluded, that Judge Moran is exquisitely sensitive to the risk that in the course of clarifying the contours of customary international law, through the vehicle of criminal trials, a tribunal can undermine core principles of fair process. And standing up for justice devotes a lot of attention to this and related challenges. And where its author stands is unambiguous. Ted believes judges must be, quote, scrupulously solicitous of the rights of the accused, and he lived by this commitment throughout his tenure on the ICTY and its successor court, often as Jean alluded, um, at great personal cost. In Ted's words, quote, our lodestar must always be fairness and justice. Well, I don't share all of Ted's views about what fairness and justice demanded in specific ICTY cases. There's no doubt that he superbly modeled steadfast devotion to what he would call principled accountability. And that's had an impact. And I'll say a, a bit about that in a minute. But I just wanna um, say one word first about one aspect of the legacy of the ICTY. Um, and here again, I wanna, go back to a quote from his book, uh, Ted wrote, to my mind, there is no question that we must do our utmost to find ways to encourage states to prosecute war crimes before national judiciaries in accordance with international legal norms and to facilitate their effort in doing so. This is an imperative if the new era of accountability is truly to take hold both globally and locally. Um, <coughs> many of us find it easier to think of situations where horrific crimes have been met with impunity than to think of examples of national prosecutions of these crimes. But in reality, the ICTY and its sister tribunal for Rwanda uh, and other international courts 
have had a profound impact on state courts. A project at my law school that was initially created to provide legal analysis to the first prosecutor of the uh, ICTY has for years been um, providing similar analysis to support domestic war crimes courts. And in every project it undertakes, I can't think of a single exception. Uh, the starting point for the project's analysis is the ICTY's case law. And that case law has in turn been cited in war crimes cases in myriad countries um, that have been emerging from ghastly conflicts. In the former Yugoslavia, some of these courts have revamped their procedures to meet the standards of fairness modeled by the ICTY and more personally by Theodore Marone. Um, in much the same spirit that um, is imbued and that Ted imbues in, throughout his book, these countries hope that by enforcing the law of humanity, while upholding rigorous standards of due process, they will build the rule of law case by case in a country um, where institutions and uh, principles of fairness were decimated uh, and they are rebuilding on a firmer foundation as a result of uh, the fairness and case law that Ted helped create. So congratulations on this extraordinary book more important on extraordinary achievements and contributions. Thanks, Diane. Um, Ted, would you um, like to respond to some of those comments? Uh, microphone. I don't know whether I would like to use the word like, but uh, I don't think I can not respond. Let me start by saying that I'm extremely grateful to all of you and uh, very, very touched by your comments. Uh, actually, ages ago, I was saying to myself that I would like to spend, uh, when I'm really, when I really have grown up, I would like to spend uh, my last uh, few years as a don in Oxford or in Cambridge. And two of the people in this panel played an important role in helping me achieve that. Philippe, by recommending me to his friends in Oxford, and Dapo, by being one of the people in Oxford who made it possible for me to be appointed in, in, in 2014 as a visiting professor in Oxford which I still am. Now moving to the uh, subject, but before that, Diane mentioned the cursed judgment. Uh, on the 10th anniversary of Srebrenica, as president of the ICTY, I was invited to speak uh, in Srebrenica. It was an incredible sight, thousands of women in Muslim dress sitting on the hill it was a sort of a crater, and the podium was full of people far more important than myself, including Jack Straw. I was among the last speakers, uh, which was fine. And I, um, I gave a speech in which uh, I focused, of course, on our judgment in the case of Kerstich. In the middle of the speech, suddenly, there was a tremendous applause from the women mostly women, were on, on that hill listening to the proceedings. And I had no idea why at that particular moment they would choose to applaud. And I asked somebody when the speech was over and he said, don't you know you were the first person among all those dignitaries who mentioned the word genocide? And I was very, very touched by that. Um, uh, Diane mentioned the basic question, what do we need tribunals such as uh, this one for? Perhaps one of the main reasons is that they pre provide a rule of law, um, an honest uh, uh, due process uh, basis for dealing with high level war criminals. Letting them free is uh, of course untenable, 
and so is summer execution or perpetual detention. So you, the only thing left is some kind of process of law. And the, the ICTY and its sister institution, ICTR, I believe provided this kind of process of law. It was um, those years at the ICTY, as I say in the book, have been very hard, often frustrating, but also extremely gratifying. They've been very difficult because you worked constantly within the competing, you try to introduce um, law and evidence as the only guidelines, as the only lodestars to a situation of competing narratives. Competing narratives of ongoing struggles between ethnic and religious groups fighting for the legitimacy of their own historical perspectives, uh, fighting for the conflicting visions of rights and wrongs based on their conflicting visions of victimhood. Uh, um, Diane mentioned uh, the different perspectives, different agendas of the um, stakeholders involved. Uh, um, one of them was seeking truth another peace and reconciliation, or giving victims justice. But at the end of the day, really the goal of all of this is to remember that justice is not about achieving a particular outcome, reaching in a particular case um, a conviction or an acquittal. It is about a principled process that serves the rule of law and um, and um, and um, um, respects um, uh, due process in all the stages. Now, um, perhaps the most um, the most um, gratifying aspect of my judicial experience has been what we have achieved in matters of law. In the first place, we have fleshed out norms governing the law of genocide law governing uh, crimes against humanity and law governing war crimes. I am, and, and that includes uh, the law uh, dealing with uh, uh, gender violence, with rape. And one of the things of which I am sort of proud is that in 1993, uh, I wrote an editorial in the American Journal of International Law, rape as a war crime under international law. At that time, it was not accepted that the rape committed in non-international armed conflict could constitute a war crime. And um, even uh, some friends in the ICRC at that time uh, were not prepared um, to reach uh, um, a sort of uh, conviction that rapidly we, mo we must move toward the reform and modernization of that system of law. And it really took uh, uh, the terrible abuse and rape of thousands and thousands of women in former Yugoslavia um, um, to, to, for the governments, for the ICRC, for the governments, for states, for the scholarly community, for judges, to reach the conclusion that we must approach this uh, um, subject in the law uh, in, a, in a new way, in a progressive way, but a way in which it could not, the solidity of which could not easily be attached. And by a strange coincidence, my very first uh, bench on which I sat in the ICTY, I was not presiding over that uh, appeal case. I was uh, five, one of five judges, but I played a part in it, was the famous case of Kunara. Kunarak um, uh, really was quite revolutionary in terms of uh, human rights. It confirmed uh, first, before I go to rape, it confirmed that um, with regard to the um, crime of torture, uh, it departed, it departed, which was some quite a major move for a nascent, for a new international criminal tribunal. We departed from the definition of torture in the UN Convention Against Torture. We did not accept uh, 
insofar as individual criminal liability is concerned, the fourth element of the definition, and the fourth element was the participation of a public agent or, a, or of a person acting in, in public capacity. We said that definition was fine for uh, responsibility of states, for relations between states. It limited the responsibility of states to, to the prosecution of persons for, for torture only if a public agent was involved. But it was not part of customary international law uh, pertaining to individual criminal liability. But even more was what we did with regard to, to gender crimes and rape. It was the first case in which we dealt with definition of sexual enslavement. We um, ruled that continues that the argument of the defense that the rape can only exist when there was a continued, continuing resistance on the part of the victim, that this made no sense. We rejected the, that argument and so on. And parallel with that, and this is very important for students of international law, we developed the rules of procedure, the famous Rule 96, it was 96, both in the rule of procedure of the ICTY and the ICTR, in which we made the litigation itself somewhat more protective uh, of the rights of the victim. In most cases, of course, that would be the woman. And um, in, in, in our practice, we dealt with the crime of rape many a time. And um, the fact that we, for instance, in that rule, did not allow um, evidence to be introduced regarding past sexual experience of or life of the, of the victim. In those respects, we made it much more easy for uh, much, much, we made it much easier for the victim uh, not to suffer, not only in the beginning the rape, but then the process it, itself in which uh, uh, some people would tend to regard the, the women as, uh, as uh, up to a point of participating willingly and so on. These were outrageous allegations. And I think the tribunal's um, progress on that was very important. We also created a corpus of rulings on procedure and evidence. You did not have anything of this kind in Nuremberg and we often forget in comparing due process in Nuremberg to due process in modern courts in the ICC, ICC and in the ad hoc tribunals, we, um, uh, we do not remember that in Nuremberg, you had only 11 short and highly inadequate rules of procedure with dealt, which dealt with uh, due process. We elaborated in our uh, in our jurisprudence on the principle of legality. And we brought about, I think, and I thank you for um, uh, mentioning that, uh, Dapo uh, uh, and Diane, we elaborated on the principle of legality and brought about a real revival of international customary law in the area of international humanitarian law. We established principles of specificity. We said this is criminal law and criminal, um, you cannot have criminal convictions unless you base yourself on a norm which is specific enough. And take, for example, Common Article 3. We recognized and applied many a time Common Article 3 as a basis for, for convictions. And yet, in the Vasilievich case, we said the words violence to life and person, and I'm quoting, um, uh, are not specific enough to justify a conviction and that the person on, and we rejected the charge based on violation of those um, words of the norm, violence to life and persons, as not being specific enough. Then we, of course, transformed norms uh, originally designed as norms of state responsibility to norms uh, which uh, govern criminal liability of individuals. And perhaps the most important case on that is the case of General Galich, 
uh, on which I sat, which uh, pertained to unlawful shooting and shelling of Sarajevo. Under the, and the Serb forces were under the command um, of uh, General Galic. Um, so, uh, um, all in all, it was um, a, an exceptional uh, experience, and um, um, I'm still, uh, believe it or not, or not, a judge of the mechanism. I do not do too much in that context, but uh, have cases from time to time. Um, one of the areas in which I was, uh, apart from one or two convictions, uh, which resulted partly because of my part, uh, actually in, at the end, in, in acquittals, one of the areas for which I have been highly criticized, and I've been thinking about that uh, often, and I'm still, uh, still criticized every, at least uh, once every two weeks, there is an article uh, about some of my quote unquote early re releases. It's, a, it's a, something for which I'm criticized by um, organs of the government in, uh, in Rwanda. Um, but there are situations on which a judge, while fully aware that what he will do, and that was, uh, I cannot blame or have any bench share the responsibility because that under the rules, under the statute, under the rules of procedure, is purely the, and exclusively the responsibility of the president. Um, um, you have to go by the rules and you have to be aware of the human rights dimension of what you do. Um, um, now, um, the, um, since no Tutsis, in effect, were prosecuted, um, the anger at uh, uh, early release was an anger which uh, focused on release of, of Hutus. In Yugoslavia, the problem was different because the persons who have returned to Yugoslavia were greeted in celebrations by the ethnic community to which uh, they returned. But uh, you must be, as a judge, deeply aware not only of international humanitarian law, but also of uh, human rights. And you know that uh, in the countries to which we typically, well, which typically agree to, to accept our prisoners for serving the remainder of their sentences, in Europe in particular, the rule is that uh, people, prisoners, should, after a number of years, be entitled to a release. And actually, if we would tell any of the European countries we will not release anybody before, before that, they would not agree to accept in many cases, they would not, or in some cases, they would not agree that they would uh, to accept those people as um, quote unquote guests in their prisons. And so there are not only human rights requirements there, we have, we have to correspond to expectations of human rights, uh, but also pragmatic considerations. If we do not that, we will not be able to place our prisoners uh, where we would have wanted to place them. Um, so um, um, uh, we applied the rules. We applied the rules regarding similarly situated prisoners, equality, gravity of crimes, rehabilitation, cooperation with prosecution, and humanitarian considerations. And um, 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 the practice of those who have preceded me as presidents of the institution counted for me a lot because of all the presidents of the ICTY and the ICTR, there was only one before me who in one or two cases refused to release people. And um, um, if, I am, if I am criticized, well, um, I think that one of the qualities of leadership 
which I have never managed to acquire, was thick skin. I really suffer from criticism. I take it very much to heart. So when I see on Google Alert every two, two weeks another set of uh, terrible descriptions of me, such as Meron is ashamed, is shame to international justice. This is not a typical type of a title. It's something which I do not enjoy, but uh, I do not uh, have much, uh, much of a choice. Um, I think we have had a great achievements. So I think we made mistakes. Um, I know that I made many of them, but um, we try to live up to the, to the goal, to the principle, to integrity, to due process. Thanks, end of speech. Uh, thanks very much, Ted. Um, I think that's a very fitting way to wrap up our uh, discussion this morning. Um, there, we, we are in any event uh, out of time. Um, uh, I see that there were several questions from Janus Kakis uh, on the group, uh, but I don't think it's going to be very productive for us to start talking about the broader situation in Palestine or the um, trials of Michael Cohen and so on in this setting. So I will leave those. Um, uh, we, I think it's on the flyer, but those who want to purchase uh, Ted's book can get a 30% discount from uh, Oxford University Press. And I would obviously warmly recommend that you take advantage of that. Uh, I just want to finish by uh, thanking Ted himself for being prepared to join us this morning uh, and, of course, for giving us such uh, an extraordinary uh, tour of the very many issues that he has been central to over a lifetime of work uh, in this area. Uh, and I think it's wonderful how our three panelists really emphasize the, uh, the thread that runs through all of this work. Uh, it adds up to a, a very coherent and um, admirable uh, set of professional uh, achievements. I think it, it's wonderful that, that we have the opportunity to pay tribute to Ted. Uh, and long may he live, and we look forward to the next uh, several books, Ted. Um, but thank you. No, all no way. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> but uh, thanks all the, to all of the uh, participants. Um, it was a, a very good session, and we'll leave it at that. Bye-bye. <laughs>